worship thing. You know, it's a celebration. Jesus called his sacrifice on the cross his passion, okay? It wasn't just like something I have to do. It's my passion to do this for you guys. I really want to die for you. Yeah, it's hard. I'm wrestling through things, but not my will has been done. And for the joy set before me, I'm going to endure this for you. But your part is to take part in communion. That's what I ask of you to do, to remember my death through partaking of my body and of my blood. So we're going to do that this morning. And remember the Lord. Remember this personal, intimate covenant he made with us. He is in our life forever now. We are forever joined with the Lord. If we have died to the world and to sin, to our old man, then we've been raised to life in Christ. And you're living by the Spirit now. The Spirit of God in you. So amen. I'm going to read uh, Matthew 26, 26 through 28. So you can turn there if you want. Uh, we're going to pass offerings real quick. Brother, go right to communion. I'll come back to offerings after, but I want to hit this right now as we're just raw in the spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. And it says this in Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Yeah, you can bring up the, uh, the slide of Jesus serving as communion. I kind of want to have that symbol up there in front of us. I'll wait for that. Yeah. So communion is something we want to have consistently in our life. It's not just something we do once every three months or four months. Some don't even do that. You know, and you can get away from it if you're not careful. But we want to be consistent with the Lord. And he said, as often as you do this, meaning you can do it as often as you will, do it in remembrance of me. So here we are. So here's the Lord. To remember him is about a personal connection with God here. Um, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it. It's a picture of his own life being blessed, taken, blessed, and broken for us on the cross so he can give life to us. And he gave that to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The removal, I'm dealing with the whole thing of sin and judgment right now. In this, I'm taking it upon myself. You are forgiven, you're remitted. When something's remitted in an official court, it's thrown out of the court council and goes down to lower level settling, it's done. It's no longer on the table for decision. Through the shedding of blood, there's remission of our sins. So you remember that this morning. So we've got the communion cups ready. Um, we'll start with the body, which is the bread, just kind of in the order that the scripture says. So why don't you come on up and, well, what we could do is probably serve it. Would you mind taking that through the aisles? Um, do you guys stay seated? Yeah. Yeah, just take the bread. Thank you. Let me help you. All right. And I want you guys as much as possible to stay right in the heart realm with this communion. Sometimes we get up here too much. And God wants to liberate. He wants to exchange in the heart level through this. Thank you. Hallelujah. So just, just, yeah, praise him, bless him. Remember him. We remember you, God. Your passion. You look forward to this meal. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're broken for us. You give yourself away to us. You're broken now, you're being made alive. He took our judgment for us, Lord. And with that, all the ordinances, all the law that speaks against us, He crushed it, Lord. And you considered a new covenant with your body and your blood, a living way, by spirit, by faith. Okay, good. So everyone has that. Let's just go ahead and. Father, we thank you for your body. We thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for the brokenness you endured, Lord, not just to 
make us think of how much you did, but to really bring forth life into our mortal beings, into our bodies, into our spirit. So Lord, we take this, Lord, and if there's anything that we need healing in our bodies, any areas of unforgiveness, we confess that and say, forgive us, God, for those things. Lord, may healing rise up as we partake of your body, and we have faith this morning on it, Lord. So go take and eat. Break it and eat it. We bless it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Yeah, don't rush through it. Just think about how what this means to you. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. I feel the power of God flowing right now. Thank you for your body, Jesus. Thank you for your body, Jesus. Receive it, Lord. We receive what you did. We thank you. Mm. Sweet healing, Bob. Sweet healing. Mm. The bread of your presence. And then he took the cup. We'll get cups out to everybody here too. And something in good in time and communion is just to think of if there's any error in your heart or in your life where you need to reconcile with God on anything. It's not a promise to be perfect. It's a settling of I'm resting again in the finished work of the cross. I'm taking those things of my heart that needs to be surrendered, maybe afresh in a new way. And I just laid it at your feet, Lord. Yeah, we're sure. And you're saying I'm putting a higher emphasis on what you did for me than anything I could have done to myself. The situation I'm in, the circumstance I've been in. I'm letting your body heal me. I'm trusting you. I'm being found in Christ. Whoever eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood will live forever, and I will raise him up on the last day. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the wine, the cup of wine, the cup of your blood. The remission of our sins. We're forgiven, Lord, in you. We've received life in you. So we bless the cup of the Lord. We thank you that it sits before us this morning. So much by grace that we're here. We're, we're in your kingdom, Lord. We don't even know how that happened. It's just a blur. This life is just a blur. But here we are, behold, with the cup of remission of sins and forgiveness in front of our hearts. And Lord, we partake this morning. We bless the blood of Jesus. We receive it, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' name. So take and drink. Again, this backside is just the faith of God. He's just here. You can trust the presence. He loves you. He's pouring his love on us all morning. We just remember again the atonement. We thank you, Lord. Give you all praise and glory and honor forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Praise the Lord. Again, this is something I encourage you to take at home as well. You'll have a real intimate, like to carve out 20 minutes to do it. And just put yourself at the table with the Lord. And just be intimate. It's really powerful. When I have done that, I've had such amazing encounters with God, such peace and joy and love, and it's awesome. So, oh yeah, thank you. Amen. So we're gonna go into the message now. Um, everyone feeling all right? Doing okay? Hanging in there? Good. Amen. Glad to be alive, man. <laughs> If we are going to take an offering. Yeah, we're going to take an offering. Um, I wanted, uh, Allison, if you wouldn't mind sharing a testimony. Um, okay, so we, in the, in the house, we really believe in tithes and offerings, not because we want your money, but because, I mean, we use the money to help around here. But honestly, it's a principle in the kingdom. As you know, anyone who's been tracking with us, we teach on this a lot because I want your finances to be blessed. And I want you guys to be good stewards of the resources God gives you. It goes way beyond finances, too. But as you begin to partner with God, then he begins to partner with us. And he does the impossible. We give our two fish and five loaves, or however that was, 
and he gives us 5,000 to feed a thousand, like 5,000 around us. So we're learning to partner again with God, and that's what we lost in the garden. We lost a, we got an independent spirit. So we're breaking that even by giving of our treasure, of our time, and our energy to the kingdom, and watching how God returns it in this life and age to come. So an amazing breakthrough for Allison and Christian, something they've been believing for for a long time, is a car. She actually has to stroll her baby to the workplace every week, every day that she's working here, and because Christian needs the car to go to work. And so they've just been praying, even setting, thank you, brother, setting aside money for a car to come by faith and just trusting God. But they've been sowing financially and tithing, giving offerings unto the Lord. And in this house, I'm sure there's other places they're giving too, but they're trusting God with their finances. So it was an amazing thing. Um, Allison, come on up. And she had this wild, this thing where she went up to her, probably the last place to expect this to happen, but we pray blessing and provision to come as you guys are sowing. So go ahead and share. Um, probably loud enough, but just for the sake yeah. of recording. Blessing can come in some of the weirdest places. Um, my dad's side of the family started this kind of long story. But no, God okay. just basically took the whole situation and put a big bow on it. And um, But my dad's whole side of the family is Jewish, and they live up in New York. Well, my grandmother, she was 86, so she passed away two Tuesdays ago. Yes. And it's actually been that long. Um, but she had a 2007 Toyota Camry with about 40,000 miles on it and nobody else in the family really needed it and uh, so first off I mean God provided with getting me and my sister plane tickets that we originally thought the cheapest was going to be about $560 and somehow by the grace of God my mom was able to find for the two of us after taxes and everything about $786 so it was about $200 less per person that we than what we initially thought. And last then, minute, too. <laughs> last minute. Like, for, I was going to say, that was last minute purchase <laughs> basically the day before we were going to be leaving. And then um, my family, like my brother and my sister, we went out to eat as soon as we got there. And without me asking or anything like that, they decided they were going to pay for my meal. So that was another blessing in and of itself. And then... My family the next day after the funeral, we're at my grandmother's house, all eating and everything. And uh, basically, my uncles, my dad, and my brother and sister basically surround me and say, "Nobody else needs the car but you. You get to have the car." Mm. So my grandmother was also the kind of person that she was able to pay for it in cash when she bought it. So there's no car payments. And so next week, my dad and I are going to, not next week, in a couple weeks, we're going to be flying up to New York, and then we're going to be driving it back down. So, Can we praise God for that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. Awesome. It's amazing. We get so desperate. We're so intense with our prayers for the breakthrough. But when it comes, we're like, oh, cool, that's crazy. But do we come back and say thank you? You know, sometimes you just need to make sure that we say thank you to God, even though we're happy and blessed in the moment. We're like, praise the Lord. It's good to say thank you. So, Lord, we do thank you for the miracle you provided for Allison and Christian. They've needed this, Lord. You've seen this, Lord, and you provided an incredible way, Lord God. Fully paid, all that stuff. So you. And so we thank you, God. We receive that as a blessing in our house. And we just thank you for them. Bless that car. Put angels around it so they always drive safe, Lord. And um, it just lasts super long. Give it sandals, if you will, that will never run out. And um, give them just even more favor on the mechanics of it, Lord. So we thank you, God. And we bless you this morning. We thank you for that, Jesus. Precious name, amen. So this morning, we're going to talk just a little bit about on tithes and offerings for a moment before we take the offering. But I want you guys to be full of faith. This is what happens when you partner with the Lord. This is what happens when you give your, your sack lunch to Jesus and he just blows it up. <laughs> so this is just the beginning. And God takes it to infinite levels. Abraham didn't seek out trying to get rich. But he gave and tithed because he wanted to partner with God in life. And God made him huge. He had more livestock, more of this than anybody. And he wasn't even, his identity wasn't even found in that either. He kept, I want the promised son. Where's the promised son? Where's you and me? Where's our journey? And that's beautiful. But God has no problem giving that, especially as you give to others and you're generous with it. So when we, we love because we receive love, right? How about will we be generous when we receive generosity from the Lord? Yeah, you bet. You watch how that will birth that in your heart. But first, sometimes you have to first sow, first give. So here's Jesus speaking on giving. Matthew 6 is a great chapter for this. But he talks about motivation. And he says in uh, verse 1 through 4, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men. Yes, we'll take an offering right here this morning, but... A little different, get the heart of this, okay? Um, otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Stop there for a moment. This is about you and your Father. 
It's even past the principle. So if I could give this good principle, that's one level. Another level is like, I don't even care if I get nothing back. I want me and my father, and I can hide it from the whole world. Because I want him. So God's Jesus is saying, you want the father, so do this. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites, do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory from men. So many people do stuff for the glory of man. I mean, and it's way beyond giving. They do it for the glory of men. He says, surely, thank you, <laughs> I say to you, they have their reward. That's it. They were really looking for that, and they got it. And they're probably pretty happy about it. But he says, I say to you, um, they have their reward, but when you do a charitable deed, if you really want the Father, you want the kingdom, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret, you're going after him, he's going after you, will reward you openly himself. Okay? So praise the Lord. So we want to give. And give definitely here is tithes and offerings, one thing, but also be just charitable in general. Buy somebody coffee. Lend to the poor. You're lending to the Lord, the Lord says. But as you give, have faith this morning. We're going to pray over this. So I can set this up here and come on up and give. So tithes and offerings, you have that. And it doesn't have to be big. God's looking at the heart. Well, bigger the better. I mean, for I mean, it's just Solomon was supposed to. Thank you, bless you, brother. Uh, gave like uh, thousands and thousands of rams. It was way beyond the law ordinance of what he's supposed to sacrifice. But God saw it. And does anybody was did Solomon get blessed financially later on in his life? He didn't even ask for that. And yeah, he did. So anyway, where you're sowing your life and your faith is what you're going to expect return on. Bless you, brother. Yeah, come on up. Amen. Bless you. Great. Don't be shy. God's going to give you a breakthrough. We're going to pray over this. You've already seen it. Um, and again, this goes to help our ministry. To keep the doors open, uh, refreshments out there for you guys, Wi-Fi going, all this stuff so we can keep this operating. That's what we, we're using this for. But um, you're also going to be blessed in this age for giving. So thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just stretch our hands forth toward this in faith. And let's believe God to just do miracles because he wants to. Father, we thank you for the miracle-working power that's present even in this room, by your Spirit. Lord, we thank you that you are a miracle-working God, that you see our need, Lord, and you desire to bless. You desire to overwhelm us, Lord. Shaken together, pressed together, or pressed down and flowing over, God. So I pray, Lord, an extravagant, abundant return on this investment. Lord, not just to be rich, not just to be having money, but Lord, but to really see that you are one you can partner with, Father. That you see what we do in secret. Lord, you bless us and that you'd take over our finances. And Lord, I pray for a double portion of wisdom as increase comes of how to steward even more faithfully before you to love people, to be generous of spirit, and to help the world, Lord God, while we have time. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Good. Well, wow. it went a little longer on it, I thought. But good. Um, great. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a couple of our dearest friends in town. Would you raise your hand, Sam Michelle? I think everybody's met you already. <laughs> We're not that huge of a jerk right now, but amen. They are so instrumental. I just want to give the honor or honor to you. Um, we probably wouldn't be in Alabama without them. We were in a very difficult time in California, um, marriage-wise, and it was just tough. It was really tough, kind of first few years of marriage, and that's when infatuation wears off, right? And all of a sudden, I leave my towels around on the floor everywhere, and she's upset about it, and I'm like, what? No big deal. All you set up, she takes over. Yeah, much bigger than that. <laughs> but that's a simple way. Yeah, so much more. And it's kind of like, you know, do we really know who each other is? I mean, who are, I mean, you're not who I thought. She kept saying, you're changing. I'm like, I'm not changing. I'm like, I'm trying to grow. I'm being faithful to my job. What am I doing, you know? But there's things. It was like, we're, I don't know what it was. It's just we're getting to really know each other. Could you put your best face forward? So at any rate, um, Sam and Michelle, yeah, they bailed us out. I'm like, Sam called Michelle. Michelle, you got to go hang out with Rachel. I'm going to get with Justin. I was in, in a talking mood at the time. <laughs> oh, it was really hard. But Sam broke through to me, and he told me keys, and he shared life. He was vulnerable with me and his own stuff and said, God can help you, and you need to restore this. You need to go for it and really seek this to get help, and God will help you. So I thank him for that. And ever since then, it started a small group for us where we just met organically in California around the Word of God and the Spirit. We go until like 2 or 3 in the morning. They had kids. We didn't. We didn't understand that that was rough. But we, God spoke to us and prophesied over us, and we heard, heard words of Alabama and began to restore that for the first time, and God began to confirm it, speak it, and then here we are 20 years later. So thank you, Sam Michelle, publicly. We love you guys. 
and bless you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Um, great. Oh, um, okay, so this is we're going to talk about the voice of the Spirit. And we talked a little bit last week about the hearing of faith. So it's interesting because in what we went over is Paul was getting saved out of the law mentality. The law mentality destroys faith. Okay? Now, the law is good. That's what's confusing a little bit. Because without the law, I wouldn't know what righteousness was. And I don't get saved and go become a lawbreaker. That's just as bad as anything. But I don't begin to equate my spirituality and maturity off law only because that's limited. And in fact, if I begin to give my justification off law, do's and don'ts, I begin to rebuild something that empowers my sinful nature to want to rebel. It's the weirdest thing. So although the law is good and I understand the law, I don't focus that, you know. I have a grid and I understand God's righteous ways, but I don't get there by focusing on law and that only. I get there by a living act of faith in the spirit of Jesus and following the voice of God. And that's the gift God has given us through Christ Jesus. Um, all right. All right. All right. So... I want to read this verse to you guys here, just kind of establishing that concept or that understanding in Galatians 3, 1 through 9. It says this, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? He was dead. The whole law system died. He took it upon himself. Over. He was portrayed to you as crucified. That whole thing's done. This only I want to learn from you did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? I want to know that. You need to answer that. Don't memorize that. Answer that. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? This is critical. He's undoing uh, deception right now. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Indeed it was, and it says, have you suffered so many things in vain? Because you didn't turn to the law when you got saved. You turned to him, to Jesus Christ. And you suffered for it by the hands of those who are under the law. So did you suffer all that in vain when you did that? Now that you're back under the law? So you can establish righteousness of your own? That's what he's saying here. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, all the stuff of the kingdom, all the manifestation of Jesus on earth in our midst, and now moving in the church, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, he believed God. I believe the report. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So what is the hearing of faith? What interesting stuff he's dropping because I thought the law came from God. And I thought by building that, we're supposed to study that and understand that, yes, we are. But it doesn't save you. It doesn't deliver you. It was given to expose you. It was a tutor, what Paul says, to bring you unto that perfect thing, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if we hang on to the book and we miss Jesus, they did that. Moses we know about. Abraham we know about. But who are you? I'm not switching. I have no room for the witness of the Spirit, the voice of God active in my life right now. That's Even though it's, I, 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 I can't. And yet if they're honest, they could see it. Jesus prophesied himself all out of the Old Testament in the road to Emmaus. But they couldn't see it. They were stuck in a form of building law by the mind. Studying this, studying this, studying this, studying this, but it's not transforming me. In fact, he had so much rebuke for hypocrisy. It's one thing to hear things outwardly, but not have the inner change. And this summer, God's taking us into deep inner change. I know that by the Spirit. But if we don't allow ourselves to move out of just knowledge-based theology and mental ascent understanding of just what the Word said, which is good, we should have grid. And it doesn't translate into me hearing God and me obeying the Spirit of Jesus. Where am I, I going to end up with this? I'll probably have a limited understanding that's here and very controversial to anybody who thinks otherwise. And now I've moved into a place of faith and love and joy that can be tested by the word into a place of judgment because you don't measure up to my standard. And I refuse you and I reject you. Well, that's big stuff. 
But hearing the word release salvation, miracles, and, and, and signs and wonders. Jesus, we're going to go a couple of examples before we close. Jesus brought forth miracles by his word. Active living word. He didn't go up there and say, here's the Torah, get it done. He became the living word expressed, the voice of the Father, of the Spirit, released to this generation he was with. That's what your calling is. You're supposed to know the word, but then be the active voice of God to unlock revival, to unlock the healing, the miracles, signs and wonders. You are called to this. Not just to believe it can happen, but to flow in you. You're going to do it. You have no choice. My prophet says, I mean, you have a choice, but we're contending for this realm. Number two, everything in the kingdom is accessed by faith. Everything. There's a whole chapter in Hebrews dedicated to those who are, by faith, conquering kingdoms, subduing enemies, raising people from the dead by faith. Abraham received a son back from the dead, or Isaac, which is the type of Christ, by faith. So faith acts as it. You're saved by faith. You're saved because you heard the report of Christ and you began to feel something in here. You didn't know anything, typically. I might have heard a few, but I didn't know the depths of the word until I got saved, really. But I felt this. And I knew the report of whatever they're saying about Jesus is real. And it's affecting me at the core of my being. And I'm going to believe this. I believe the word. And I got saved by the hearing of faith. Someone preached it. And so by faith, you move in these other realms. And by faith, we're going to move in these other realms. I want to see you guys moving in realms of healing and revival in your office, in your workplace, in your campus, where you go every day. Here is great. I love miracles here. But I really love them out there a little bit more. You know what I mean? That can shift our city. As a house of prayer, we're contending for a city-wide shift, not a church increase or growth only. That'd be nice. More of you guys. I love your faces. I love to hang out with you guys. But we want to shift this place together. We're going to do it together. I think this morning in worship was awesome because I felt we went into a decree realm, even with what uh, the second song. I forget all the words on that. But I felt the shift. It was an intercessory decree by faith. And you watch it begin to manifest. Okay, so number three. Okay, basically we'll finish up the principle here in Hebrews 11. Faith can move off a couple things too when you're hearing faith, you're hearing of faith. One is by principles. So I understand the principles and I have a faith that these are right, that the word of God, that if I sow, I'll return, if I love, I'll get love and return, all these different things. He who shows himself friendly will receive friends. So there's principles. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's an active personal word right now, but it's still good things to kind of understand and have a grid for and do. But faith can also move off inspiration in the voice of God. This is a difference between what we call Logos and Rhema. Anybody heard of Logos and Rhema? You know, that's pretty common. I don't know if we throw those words around as much these days, but when I was in college, it was all over the place. <laughs> that's a Logos word. But you operate in both. It's not one or the other. You operate in both. A logos is more coming from the stem word of logic, but it's like principle ordained truth already, established truth that's already there, already in the room. It's established that God, Yahweh, is Lord, at least if you're a Jew. Now, Jesus being Messiah may not be established to me yet, even though he is the word of God. But by revelation, I get that revelation for every reason. So Rhema comes in and brings the witness and the living active word upon your life to believe. So Rhema is what I call the personal revelation. So we'll see how this manifests in these two examples here and how God wants to do this in our life. This is grid. The scriptures is grid for you and me. It's not a story you memorize, but it looks different when you walk around the earth. This is, uh, as much as we want to know what happened, we also know what can happen as we read the Bible and how we discern, begin to discern the voice of God. Peter, in this moment, we're going to talk about with the fish and the great catch he got, didn't know he was Messiah yet. He didn't confess that yet. All he saw was some rabbi, some spiritual man. Others are saying, are pretty excited about, but I don't know. And this man is teaching things that are really good. They sound good. But then he says things that... I don't even know if they're in the Bible, but he's telling me to go do something. And like, to expect something huge to happen when I do what he says. Okay? Wild, right? So this is the story here. This is the, the moment of history right here with Peter. It's his first interaction with Jesus. And you'll watch how this marks his life throughout his ministry. When he had stopped speaking, he, Jesus, said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. So what did he do? He stopped speaking. He was teaching. Teaching probably... The truth, established truth, right? They bring some more context understanding. Then he goes to Peter and brings a personal revelation. You, Peter, go. Launch into the deep 
Everything Jesus says is loaded. You can hit it from a million angles. Go out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. What's Peter doing? He had just come back and gave his boat to Jesus to preach. He's done fishing, and they caught nothing. This is what he says. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. How many have felt that way in your life? My gosh, we've been praying and interceding for revival for seven years now? <laughs> I mean, I'm expecting not just a little more anointing. I'm wanting full-blown citywide outbreak outpouring of the Holy Ghost that hits the nations, okay? That's really in my heart. I'm believing for that. Every time I pray, I'm feeling that. I'm sensing that. I'm going for it. And I'm contending, and it's been all night long. And there's times we don't feel like we see much of anything. I'm working to establish truth. And the word of the Lord will come to us and speak a divine time and a divine directive. That's what happened for Peter. So Peter, I love him because he's honest. That's what Anne was talking about, being sincere. But then he's also obedient. Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. I'm the fisherman, you're not. It's, I, I know this stuff. I've been out there. I'm not going to go back out there. That's what he's really saying. He's a little bit offended. But nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net, which means everybody off the boat, everybody back on the boat, get all the nets and go back into the deep. It's a lot of work and process before the manifestation of the word. It was like you just reached down in the water as soon as you said and pulled up a fish. You had to get all the gear back out at the risk of it. Maybe you've been all there all night. I don't know. And when they had done this, when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So you p see Peter beginning to experience the rhema voice of God in his life for possibly the very first time ever. What did that look like for Abraham? Come out of your tent, and I'll make you a mighty nation. And at some point, you're going to have to move off just simple gridded knowledge of the Bible to trusting a word of the Spirit to you. What's that voice sound like? What did Jesus sound like? Were any of you there to hear what his voice sounds like? I wasn't. And you know how many times I've said, if Jesus just came to my shore personally, I would believe. Has he ever come to my shore personally like that? No. And I wrestle with that with my calling. Because I'm like, surely if he showed up, I would drop my nets. I was in the middle of a work. I was doing business. I had a lot of things I had to figure out in the natural realm to get myself point A to point B to point C. And I was getting a sense, even with Sam Michelle, that we're having to move back to Alabama. I thought I was done here. <laughs> you know, I love Alabama, I love Auburn, but I want to come back for a game maybe once in a, 10 years. I don't want to move back. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I love Auburn, but, you know. I was in California. You could, best malls, best shopping, all that stuff. But I needed to know, because this is rising up in my spirit. We're getting prophetic word. The active voice of God's coming in our direction. What do we do with it? I can easily see how it could keep going without it. And, and I can see how it could be blessed. But this word's on my shore speaking to me. Go. So by God's grace, we pray. And I've learned of anything. Married couples out there, you've got to get in agreement before you do anything. Or else you'll be up at night putting coffee on it in the morning. <laughs> but um, anyway, I'm talking about, but we had to pray. Okay, Lord, keep confirming. And he began to confirm more. But then we stepped out and things just and as we did, then he spoke some more. So I was praying up at Bethel, and we had one more final sign that was dropping. I just want to share this to give you guys encouragement, because God can speak. Again, the question of his voice is not just what does it sound like, what's it look like, so I can define it in this one little box, and I'm only going to obey when that box thing shows up. No, it's what does it not sound like. So you're not just dialing in on a form. You're dialing in on a fragrance of the Spirit of God. He could speak through your friend. He could speak through a billboard, but you're catching it by the Spirit. He can speak to you by the time on your clock. I've woken up and looked at my clock, and the Lord said Romans 3.20 or whatever. And I'd go look up, boom, it hit me. So there's just a myriad of things, but it's catching the fragrance of the active rhema voice coming to you. And it's coming to you. Today, if you hear my voice, not read my word, today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your hearts. So you are hearing, you're called to hear, and you're probably already hearing, you're just not understanding if you're missing some things. Or you're, you're getting frustrated by delay, what seems like delay. At any rate, so I went up to Bethel, and Chris Valton, everyone know Chris Valton? He's amazing. you got to podcast him once in a while. He's got some really good stuff. But anyway, he was up there. He preached a sermon called Killing Giants, one of the best ones I think I've ever heard. And it's so applicable to me. And he said um, just about David running to the line. It wasn't just like he walked up, but he ran with faith, and he decreed and declared, and just so much stuff about that, and then he threw the rock, you know? And so 
to me, I'm just like, man, that's it. I feel, Lord, and I was praying all this time. Like, Lord, how do I know when you're coming to my shore like Peter saying, drop your nets and follow me? Because I'll do it if I know it's you, but I can't if I don't because there's a lot of good reasons why I should be doing what I'm doing right now. And so I prayed that. And then this message came and I felt, you know what, I think maybe that's the Lord for me. It was so strong, so on point, so perfect, spoke to me. It's like thousands of Bethel people there and Chris is just talking to me having a conversation. I'm like, what? So Rachel and I, we agree. We're like, no, that was amazing what happened there. <laughs> so we're going to go, and, and we go back down the Bay Area. It's about a five-hour drive, whatever. And um, as we're going down there, I'm like, you know, I really feel like God has spoken. All these signs have measured up, and we're in agreement. I, I just think, she's like, you know, I'm in agreement, too. We really are to leave, drop stuff here and go to Alabama and see what God has for us. We didn't know the house of prayer either yet. We were going by faith, following the voice. So as we did that, we're driving along. We made that decision. We said, thank you, Lord. Thank you for meeting us. It was a wonderful time at Bethel. We enjoyed it so much. And as we're driving, all of a sudden, this truck pulls in front of me. And I'm like, wow, you're cool. I didn't, I mean, this old blue truck. But for some reason, I love personal license plates. I think they're so cool. And they, you know, just sometimes they're horrible. Sometimes they're good. They're clever. So anyways, I'm watching this, driving behind about two miles. I finally look at it, staring in front of me. And it simply says... F-O-L-O, or coming this way, M-E. Follow me. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. I took a picture of it while driving. Don't take pictures while you're driving. But I did, and I Facebooked it. I'm like, this is nuts. You have no idea where I've been praying. Or I've been earnestly desiring to hear, but I need to know it's not just me. It can't be something else. i got to know it's God. Boom, 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 right there. So I resigned my job. I was working for my dad. It's very difficult to do that. My dad loved having me there. I loved being there. It's part of it. You know, it wasn't my passion or my calling, but still. So I had to turn the resignation letter in because it can't just be a two-week notice when it's your dad, okay? <laughs> and so when I did it, I told Rachel, I dropped off very hard, and I said, Rach, I threw the stone today. Not toward my dad, but toward this whole thing that was blocking me from my destiny, right? In Christ. So there's an action point I had to take on the backside of the follow me. Peter had to go out and got a catch for his, of his life. But guess what he did? What he didn't do is start a big old fishing business. He dropped everything and followed Jesus. And he gets the first 3,000 person catch in Acts 2 in the outpouring. He let out for a deep bend. He got a boldness. When God moves, I move. So things are done. There's a harvest. Okay, so that's Peter. Um, next one real quick, and we'll finish with this. Um, but I encourage you guys, at some point, you're going to hear this voice. You're going to have to trust it, test it, go with it, be open to it. It'll keep your faith alive. If you kind of set out your own path and just keep God as a realm of history and theology, it's going to fade out. It's going to go cold. You need a living vibrancy in your faith. So this is Philip. He's an Ethiopian believer. Or not Ethiopian. He's a believer. He saves an Ethiopian guy, baptizes him. He's amazing because he's moving in the realm of Christ in faith. And he's at such a level, there's distinctions on his life that you don't see on everybody else. But I believe a lot of people are moving this, and to this day, people are moving in these realms. But it said this is Philip. Now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Was that Logos or Rhema? Rhema, exactly. There's nothing in Leviticus 2 that says, and one day thou shalt be an angel that talks to Philip on the road. That would be easy, right? If you read it and remembered it. But you're not living up here off history and memorization. That gives you grid for what God does for you now. He hears an angel of the Lord speak to him in New Testament, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So if you can break down what geological stuff, I'm probably, probably a little bit more difficult than you think or whatever, but he does it. He arises. That's a whole other key when we talk on the angelic realm and understanding communication from the spirit realm, which we're going to cover this summer. He arise from that, meaning he's laying down in a place of rest. Okay, that's a major key in receiving from the Spirit. Okay? You've got to rest and wait on the Lord. God can sovereignly get you whenever he wants. You don't have to do nothing for that. But if you want an active place of hearing God, potentially you've got to get in your secret place and listen. So the angel says to him, arise now and go toward the south along the road, which goes from down, reducing to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose, action point off the voice. Right? Action point. So many of us love Revelation to stay there. But what does I do with this? Something Sam teaches very well. It's like we read the word. Now what is our action point behind just reading the statement of Christ? Okay, let's do it. And so he went, arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury. What a person to find. <laughs> and had come to Jerusalem to worship. The cool thing when you work with the Spirit is he knows everything. You don't know nothing. 
I'd go find the guy who's probably in the death metal band that hates Jesus. I don't know. Hey, there's my guy, you know. And maybe that's the Lord, you can leave. But, but it's neat when you start to hear, you start to trust, and you go to the Spirit, and He's setting everything up for us. That's the walk of faith. So he goes there, and he finds this guy. And he comes to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, was returning back to Ethiopia. And he said he was sitting in his chariot. He was reading, by happen chance, the prophet Isaiah. What a divine encounter. Wow. Wouldn't that give you more boldness? So when he sees this, he finds him, sees him in this chariot. Then the Spirit said to Philip. Isn't that interesting? There's an angel in the spirit realm, and now there's a, the Spirit is speaking to him. None of this is something where Jesus wrote down something years ago and said, do this, Philip, when you're born. This is active, real-time instruction, direction by the spirit realm. You have to go here. You cannot get around it if you want to progress in faith. You will not do it. You must begin to test God in these areas and listen and step out and risk. So Philip ran, or the spirit says, go near and overtake this chariot. Isn't that interesting? Well, I thought the angel already said, go get the guy. But now the Spirit is speaking in the rhema, go overtake the chariot. So he ran, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? What a great way to intro to break the ice, right? Do you understand what you're reading? Hold on to that for evangelism. Find somebody doing something spiritual and break into it and say, hey, do you know what you're reading? It's a great key right there. Boom. Just throw that out there. Uh, next one here. So he goes and he blows those voices. And what we see later on is that this guy says, I want to be baptized now. I don't understand it. Show me unless someone tells me. So man is involved with this. Why don't the angel just talk to the Ethiopian and the spirit just get him? Because God's using us. That's another huge key. He wants to use us. He's restoring not just this, but this. So he does it. The Ethiopian gets baptized like right there, right on the road. Doesn't wait for the pool and book Jerusalem or go back. Right there, bam. Baptizes him, and then he takes off in the spirit, transported eight miles to Azotus. That's a whole other sermon. But if you see it, he's working the spirit realm already, which is now opening up access to greater manifestation of glory. Right? But he's faithful a little. You'll get what? More. But he's taking a risk. He's taking a risk. He's trusting. But he's developing this language. So this is some questions for us this morning. I feel God has for us. We'll close with this. Are you hearing by faith? Are you hearing the voice of the Spirit in your lives? It's one thing to come in here and feel the Spirit. That's good. I love to feel the Spirit. But are you hearing when he shows up in the room, does he just show up in the room? What if I want to go hang out with Joel? I'm like, Joel, let's go hang out. And we go, I go to his house, he lets me in, I sit down, just stay there, say nothing. And then I get up about 20 minutes later and walk out the door. Thanks for coming. Uh, I guess that's all you want to do. It's kind of weird. God's way more relational and personal than we are. So when God shows up in the room, do we ask him, why are you here? What do you want to do today? Do we get personal intimate with him? Nobody showed up at my house and said nothing and walked out 10 to 20 years later. Nobody. But we treat God like that and we're okay with it. And we kind of tune it out. As long as we feel his presence, we're good. We've had a connection. Maybe we're being healed. Some things are going in our heart realm, but we're not getting communication or directives from it. God told me this is like, when you get in my presence, ask me stuff. Would you talk to me and trust I might tell you something? Instead of just delight always just in my presence, that's great. But you can stay there your whole life and never progress in the things I want to take you into. So are you hearing the voice of the Spirit in your life? And that's personal, you guys. you got to pay the price to ask Him to speak to you. I can't just lay hands on you and, and, and you get it. This is your walk with God. By your faith, you stand. So you got to learn to test it. i got to try it. See if it's God. Write it down. Take a notebook. Say, Lord, this summer I'm signing up to hear your voice and to learn it for real. Number two, does the voice test true to the Logos? So yeah, we're moving in Rhema, but we never get away from the Logos. It can never contradict that's our grid to understand it's, it's valid. If Philip were the voice of an angel speaking to him, I'm sure at some level he's like, well, this is normal if you understand anything about the history of the prophets and the Torah. Angels exist. And they're God's message to holy ones. You're following them. There's holy ones. The holy ones would never commend me to Christ's gospel or speak that. So I'm testing. Things are lining up. So you have a grid for the Logos to get a grid for the rhema. They work together. It's like the mind and the heart working together as one. If you're only in the Logos and you block the voice, you'll miss. If you're only in trying to hear this, but you're not reconciling this, you can go almost anywhere. You can be, you can be, who's on the sled? You need to test all things, try all things. So number three, are you mixing the voice? If you're getting that voice in your life, are you mixing with faith? What are you doing about it? Man, God gets me on this one all the time. I love to hear. I love to see. And the voice of God, by the way, is not always just the voice. You're seeing visions. They'll speak. Micah said, I'm going to look to see what the Lord has to say. 
I'm going to look for my rampart to see what he's going to say versus I'm going to listen and just try to hear. So the communication arm is very broad, big. I'm perceiving the move of the spirit and perceiving what he's saying. So when you get that, what are you doing with it? And what if it's like, okay, I saw myself in a vision 10 years from now, like ministering in Africa and, and doing crusades and stuff. Okay, cool, great. Well, I'm like still in the middle of school right now, and I have no release from my job. Okay, so then I guess I have nothing to do with that word. No, you don't. You don't make it happen, but you can prepare yourself for that word to manifest. You can partner with it by faith. If the years of lights had really trusted God was going to take the promised land, you know what I'd be doing? I hoped I'd be doing this. I don't know how bad the culture was that like pushed you toward unbelief out there in the wilderness. But I would have been like practicing my sword fighting. I would have been like understanding how to cultivate a garden. How do I build a vineyard? How do I like build a home? Because I'm going to my promised land one day. And right now I'm going to prepare so as soon as I get there it's going to happen. I'm going to build know what I'm doing by faith. Even though I'm not there yet. Nothing wrong with that. Preparing by faith. Another thing you can do by that is by prayer. I can pray. Even if it's not time yet, you can pray to these things and soak it. So the seedbed of prayer with the prayer of the water, right? Water in the prayer. So that's a question to you. What are you doing with the voice God spoke to you? Many of you have received prophetic words here already. Many of you guys have also had uh, just the voice of God in dreams and visions already. How are you stewarding that? Are you even writing it down? Do that. You watch, you'll get more. You're going to activate this more, but you've got to exercise this part of your life. And then finally, or two more, are you willing to risk That's probably one of the hardest ones. Because immediately as you should start to step on like faith or something like this, what if I'm wrong? And what if I'm doing it and the guy who says, man, you're crazy already. That's not going to be the work. That's not God. There's no guarantee no one's going to resist your word from God. I'm telling you. As soon as uh, Peter said Jesus was the Messiah, Peter also said, don't go to the cross. You know? So are you willing to take a risk with what you hear? And if you are, I can tell you you're in the realm of faith. You're moving by faith. You're trusting and you're learning. If you're not, you're still in the law. Because there's fear more governing your choices in Christ than faith that he'll deliver you and take you. Does that make sense? You've got to get this, you guys. Finally, what is God saying to you and what are you hearing today? What's going on in your spirit? Did you get a dream last night? Did you get a vision? Did you get a sense that God was pointing something out, even in the worship time? God speaks to me a lot during worship. And it's a lot of exposing going on. This heart issue is the kind of go. That unforgiveness is just taking a little too much root and get out. I can't fool it. And yeah, I might not certainly say that. I have to actively put aside things that can explain or invoke those emotions that send me in tailspin, okay? But I'm responding to the voice of God. I'm putting an action point on. I'm not going to talk about that subject today. Even though it, I want to and I feel a holy righteousness. I'm trying to figure this out. I can't figure it out. It doesn't get solved that way. I've got to give it to God. Cast my care upon the Lord. And that's what I'm going to do. My action point is to not go in that conversation. I'm going to shut it down quietly and love I'm not going to put my mouth on So what's God saying to you? What are you hearing? That's what I feel God's living this way. And even if it's the smallest thing, what is the action thing you can put on it? Just by faith, because you've got to start growing here, guys. We can't keep crying out for revival and awakening and outpouring and then going to the nations without getting these in our spirit and learning to walk like Abraham. Because you're by you know, the faith of righteous Abraham, believing Abraham. Something you know, the Lord spoke to me over the house. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. We know that's a scripture, right? That's a logos. But he's bringing a rain, a hardcore in you right now. That is in you guys. There's a revival in you guys. It's you. And we so often say, if I could just get over there, I'll get revival in my life. I can just get it's inside. God's about to break open Auburn with a mighty torrent wind of his spirit that's been prophesied for years. And it's not going to come through so-and-so coming through to do a meeting. That's over. It's over. Those never work. They have a little momentum. Over. It's you and me. And us getting in touch with God inside the kingdoms inside you.
You hear me? I'm going to be pushing on that. I mean, this summer we're going to be developing our ability to hear and step out in faith. We're going to go Philip. We're going to go Peter. We're going to move in the destiny God has on our lives. And it will go way beyond this place as you guys move into your nations and places you're called to, but it begins now. You don't have to go to Bethel. You can, but you don't have to. <laughs> okay? All right, let's just pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your spirit. We thank you, God, that we're living by the spirit of God, faith in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the Logos word that gives us established truth and a grid to understand how you'll speak and how you've moved and how you move, how you are, how you've talked to Abraham, how you developed him, how you develop us, how you develop Peter, God. All these things are speaking for our faith. They're speaking to establish us in you and hearing and obeying and walking in the resurrected life. Father, I pray that your voice would explode this summer. I'm asking big, God, that your voice would explode in our midst, Lord, this summer. That you'd grant us faith to take action when you speak. And we'd actually believe it, Lord, where our hearts have grown cold in any area of a promise that we haven't seen yet. Lord, would you fan the flame that you are not like man. When you speak, it happens. I pray for visions and dreams and encounters. But more than that, I pray for a fresh grid, a fresh desire for us to sit with you and to hear you and to open our doors. You knock and let you come in and ask you to speak because we're listening to you. We're listening. Bless you this morning. Jesus, thank you.